this eventually. It's on the Discord. Right? Okay. So, um, anyways, let's let's move along. So, um, let me start by just uh, saying a few general things, and then we'll kind of hit the the main stuff uh, uh, in, in force. But generally, what's the plot of this course? If you haven't figured it out, you probably all know what the plot is. But the basic plot of algebraic geometry is that um, the geometry of um, solutions um, to um, polynomial equations um, can be encoded, um, uh, you know, in um, at least maybe systems of to be to be a little bit vague um, commutative rings. And as we'll understand, this is in some sense a kind of um, circular kind of kind of thinking. Um, but uh, so this is kind of point number one. And point number two is that um, all commutative rings um, can be interpreted as um, rings of what we'll eventually call regular. Um, functions on some um, very special, actually, topological spaces. So basically, um, the uh, like geometry is studied via rings, and all rings give geometry. That's basically the the, the mantra here. Okay. Um, Oh, I, I said mantra in my notes. Okay, mantra. Um, all commutative rings are rings of functions um, so rings of functions encode geometry. Okay? Rings equal geometry. Um, so, I mean, you know, I I, I could give um, some examples, but you know, we maybe I'll, um, you know, we've we've kind of seen a number of kinds of things. You know, uh, probably I'll just say like, you know, uh, as one example, let's say if M is a smooth manifold. I mean, soon we'll have examples that are more along the lines of the course, but if you have a, a, a smooth manifold, then, um, then the rule, which associates to an open set, um, the ring of smooth functions. So these are rings. These are, this is actually a, a sheaf as we'll define, right? Um, this, this rule, which associates a ring to every open set, this encodes, um, the smooth manifold structure. So kind of M as just like a, a bare topological space, I mean, it's just a topological space. If you want the additional information of a smooth manifold, one way of encoding it is in this rule, which tells you what are your smooth functions, right? Um, and that is, uh, that's a rule which is kind of like captured via some rings. Okay. Now, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of, um, we're going to take this mantra very far in some sense. Uh, in fact, like, you know, if I'll put example in quotes, we might say X is, let's say, a topological space consisting of a single point. And associated with that, we just have some ring R which is maybe some non-trivial ring. Maybe it's like the complex numbers, like a field or something like that, or maybe it's the rational numbers or whatever, some ring. We're going to, we're going to learn to look at this and, and not say like, you know, look, there's only one point, there's no geometry. Instead we'll say, oh, there's a ring. That's a very intricate, complicated point with some subtle geometry, <laughs> you know? Okay, so that's the frame of mind that we would like to think. <laughs> you know, you know, the geometry of that point is very subtle. You know, that's what we want to think. Okay, 
because the ring is geometry. Okay, so um, let's move along then. Uh, today we're going to be talking about sheaves, which is the, the way that we're going to kind of tie topological spaces to rings eventually and do all sorts of other things. So um, what I'm going to um, start with actually is an example. So let's have X be a topological space. And suppose we are given a map um, of topological spaces, a continuous map. We might say that F is an X space. That's simply the, the statement that, that we have a map from, some, from F to X. Let's say that F is an X space. Um, and we'll define, um, let me call it S sub pi um, to be, um, well, let me call it like this. S sub pi um, is going to be, well, it's gonna be a rule which takes some open set and associates with that open set, the maps from that open set to F which are kind of going backwards under the map pi in so-called sections. So such that pi s is the identity on u. So if we're kind of uh, drawing this, um, you know, we imagine here's our space f up here. Um, here's our space x. Maybe inside of x, we have this little like um, chunk, which is our, our u. And um, an s, is this map um, going uh, backwards, which maps S to some piece of F, such that if you do this composition from U um, back up and then down, you get the identity, which really just says that, you know, if I have a point here, it has to get sent to something kind of in the fiber over that point that gets mapped back down to that point. Yep. Okay. So, um, so now these, um, these things come with a bit of extra kind of like um, connections and structure to each other. Um, so how does, how does that work? So let's notice that, um, that if uh, V is contained inside of U, then we have a, um, a natural uh, map from s pi of u to s pi of v, which is given by taking a function to its restriction. Like if I have a map going backwards that works on all of you, I can restrict it to a smaller set and get another map like that. Um, so we'll alternately call this thing, um, you know, restriction sub s pi, um, or we might just kind of denote it by, you know, a slash with a V. Um, and it has, um, it has these properties um, such that the following kind of obvious things hold. Um, you know, we could say on the one hand, uh, if we're given um, W uh, open inside V open inside of U, then um, S restricted to V restricted to W is S restricted to W. Uh, you can kind of restrict all the way or what, you know, uh, okay. And then uh, let's see, if I, you know, if I restrict from U to U, you know, if, if I'm looking at the inclusion of U inside of U, um, so here S is in S pi of U. Um, Let's see, um, and um, and finally, um, the third thing is if UI is a cover of some open set U, then we have um, an equalizer diagram um, S. Pi of u 
mapping to s pi of uh, whoops. Lambda. Oops. Like the UIs mapping in two ways product IJ S pi UI intersect UJ. So um, I realize like, you know, not everybody thinks about equalizer diagrams and whatever. So let me just say what I'm talking about. So just recall, and I, I think I mentioned these in the homework uh, as well. So you can see another definition of these things there. So recall, um, we say that, um, that if we have maps, let's call it B, G, H, C is an equalizer diagram. Here, A, B, and C are sets, and F, G, and H are just maps of sets. If, um, if F maps A bijectively to um, the set of B and B such that G of B is H of B. So it's like it's identifying the things that get mapped to the same place in both of those maps. Okay. So um, this uh, diagram, and so though, let me say what the maps actually are in the diagram that I've drawn over here. This is a um, just a compact way of writing both of the sheaf axioms is what this is really. So here we have some tuple, let's say some little SIs over i's in our indexing set. And this goes to, um, let's say, in two different ways, some tuple consisting of some t i j's, where in the, um, let's say, in the top map, t i j is s i restricted to u i intersect u j. And in the um, bottom case, TIJ is SJ restricted to UI intersect UJ. So if we think about what this means, um, we're really saying that, um, that, that this stuff here, the, um, the maps that, that are defined on, so how do, I, how do I describe a section that goes from U um, up to F. Well, I um, one of these things is going to be determined by what it looks like on all of the UIs. So that's kind of the statement that A that in in this that in this thing here A is mapping bijectively onto some bit of B, right? So so the things in here is like a subset of the product, right? So a given S is determined by the various restrictions to a cover. And it's exactly those tuples in the cover such that if I, if I look at them, if I look on a given UIJ and I find that the restriction of SI to UIJ is the same as the restriction of SJ to UIJ, then that is something that's gonna come from one of these. Right. So the the injection of this is what we usually call the sep uh, separatedness condition, and the um, and the um, and the equalizer part, if you will, is the gluing condition. Okay. So okay. Now, uh, okay, so this is a, um, this is, uh, maybe I should, uh, well, whatever, okay. Now, so that's just an example and just, um, well, I, but I haven't told you what a sheaf is. So what's a sheaf? <laughs> Definition. A sheaf um, is a uh, functor, well, I don't know, call it F, 
from the opposite category of the category of open sets on X um, uh, to the category of, of sets. Um, although, you know, we'll, we'll the category C, so we'll actually do it in more generality, but I'll start with sets such that um, the conditions above Um, hold. So in other words, um, maybe I'll call, I'll say star, and these are going to be the star conditions. Okay. Okay. Uh, definition, a um, pre-sheaf is a functor f like this, um, such that um, f of the um, empty set uh, is a one point set. Um, you know, I, so, you know, oh, you know, or some c, I should say, and here, you know, in general, uh, you know, such that it's a terminal object. So in general, for a pre-sheaf to a category, um, we want that to be the terminal object. Although, you know, honestly, it wouldn't hurt anybody if we just dropped that axiom, <laughs> you know, and didn't distinguish pre-sheaves from functors. I'm just trying to be kind of consistent with Hartshorn here, but, um, but it wouldn't hurt anybody if I wasn't. OK. Um, Definition: A um, separated pre-sheaf um, is a um, is a functor as above, um, such that um, the um, the map f of u to product f of ui is injective for all covers UI of U. So you kind of have the left exact part of that equalizer diagram. And finally, we'll say, and this is really just for today, a, um, a geometric sheaf is a sheaf of the form S pi for some X space, um, you know, uh, F like that. And um, one of the um, kind of nice things that we'll actually um, show um, today um, is uh, I'll call it a theorem because it's nice to like have something called a theorem, you know, in a, in a given day, right? So like, let's call it a theorem and I'm going to call this, um, this is the Cayley theorem of sheaves, which is actually a horrible name. There's no name for this theorem. Okay. But, um, but it's the statement that all sheaves are isomorphic. I haven't told you what isomorphism is yet, to geometric sheaves. So in fact, um, you know, there's this, uh, you know, question of like, I, you know, I've given you the definition of a sheaf, but what is a sheaf, right? Um, and the, you know, there, there's kind of a lot of ways to, to think about these things. And of course, it's good to have a conceptually flexible framework. I mean, but you know, when you're talking about groups, somebody says like, how do you think about a group? You think about a group as like a bunch of verbs, a bunch of actions, they, they do things there. And, and this is kind of realized by Cayley's theorem, which says that you can always, if you really want to consider any group as a group of permutations of something, kind of symmetries of something or other, you know? 
Um, and so what is a, what is a sheaf? Well, um, basically sheaves are functions is the point. Sheaves are collections of functions. Um, the, the thing is, you know, they're not exactly like functions to some fixed target space. They're functions where the values the functions can take can depend on which point you're evaluating at, you know? So a nice example, and one that's going to feature, feature in some sense into the uh, bonus problem that I'm gonna stick on this next thing, uh, is think about the Mobius band on the circle, right? So uh, on the circle. So what is a, you know, yeah, if you think about a Mobius band, right? This interval that twists around as you go, um, this is a, um, you know, this, this thing naturally maps to a, a circle. Like if I think about it as like, for each point I have an interval and they just kind of twist around, then I can just say, well, kind of where, where is the kind of center of that interval and it maps down to a point on the circle, right? So the Mobius band maps down to a circle. And um, so you could think about functions on the circle, let's say to the interval zero one, if you wanted to kind of, uh, and this, this is kind of a natural kind of reasonable thing to think about. The Mobius band, if you're thinking about sections of the Mobius band though, for example, so think about the Mobius band as a space over the circle. Then these sections locally look like functions that have values from minus one to one. They're kind of like functions on the interval somehow, right? Uh, to an interval. But the problem is like, what is that interval? It's not a constant interval because as you go around, it twists and there's no kind of uniform notion of where one is. It like wraps to minus one when you go around the other side, right? So it's these are locally things that look like functions to an interval, but they're not like globally like that. They're kind of twisted. There's not like a single space you're all mapping to. And this is how to think about sheaves, I think, right? So what we'll see is that um, kind of to really like kind of ruin a lot of punchlines, the, the Mobius band is basically vectors of unit length in the sheaf O minus one on the real projective line, okay? So it's actually the tautological sheaf on the real projective line, at least the kind of inter, the unit interval of it, right? And so that's anyway. So that'll be a nice example um, to look at. But you know, the point is, is like sheaves are all sheaves are sheaves of functions. They are kind of ways of collecting functions, but this, the functions have different targets. Okay. So um, anyways, the, the, this quote unquote theorem will actually come for free out of the process of sheafification that we'll, that we'll see. All right, so um, let me just say, um, we have um, kind of like um, inclusions that's, that basically, so if you have a sheaf, then a sheaf is a special kind of um, separated pre-sheaf. And a separated pre-sheaf is a certain kind of pre-sheaf. And a pre-sheaf is a certain kind of functor. Now, um, of course, you know, we, um, you know, so I, I should say over here, when I say all sheaves, I really mean sheaves of sets. Right. So if I'm, you know, looking at, sheave, you know, sheaves of other kinds of things then I would need more information than just like a space, because that wouldn't give things the structure of like abelian groups or anything like that. Right. But, um, you know, there are variations on the theme, but I, I'll leave that to you, I guess. Um, Okay, yeah, so you have these uh, kinds of um, inclusions and, and these can be, you know, you know, really sheaves into any category, pre-sheaves into any category, you know, uh, I mean, as long as we have, um, as long as we have, for example, a terminal object so that we can make sense of when we say pre-sheave and otherwise, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, you know, okay, but in any case, so we, we have these, uh, we have these uh, inclusions. Professor? Yeah. So when you mentioned the theorem, are we, oh, it is she's a set seven. Is there a more general theorem for she's of other objects? 
the I mean, Kalethium sheaves? You know, I, 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 I haven't really thought much about like what kind of like an Uber theorem would be in some sense, like, you know, like how you would kind of collect all these various theorems, but you can say there's a, there's a similar statement that one could make about, um, you know, for, um, for groups, abelian groups, rings, um, I mean, you know, if you wanted to make a statement that was somehow true in a fairly general category, then I think, you know, you're on your own. <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, but at least for like the common objects that we'll see, you know, it's, it's all fine. And, you know, basically um, in practice, you know, the, the meat and potatoes objects are gonna be sheaves of sets and then we just give them extra structure. Like they happen to be groups or they happen to be rings and things happen to be compatible with those extra structures. So, so it's going to work for um, any concrete category, or like most concrete categories at least. Anything we would. Whatever own? that means, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. So. Um, okay. Anyway, so we have these kinds of inclusions, you know, um, just kind of definitionally, and in particular, um, you know, if I look at um, functors, by which I really mean you know, when I say functors, I mean the category of, of functors from, um, from the open sets on my thing to some category C. That's really what I'm talking about. So this is, this is a category where the uh, morphisms are, are natural transformations. And, um, and all these other things, um, the notion of morphisms is gonna be inherited from that. So by definition, you know, morphisms of, you know, sheaves, separated pre-sheaves, et cetera, these are all just um, natural transformations as above. Okay. So these, you would say that, in other words, these are all full subcategories. The HOM sets are computed in the other place, in the, that other place. okay. So as I said, you know, I want you to have in your mind the cases of interest, which are going to be where C is either sets, um, abelian groups, or um, rings, uh, commutative rings. Um, I should say, just to, to kind of come clean, you know, um, w w like in case I forget, this is really like something like, it pains me to say this because I don't want to say this kind of thing, but you know, when I say ring, chances are I mean a commutative ring. Um, with unit and associative, you know. I don't like to like always assume, you know, when you're in a conversation, you never know who you're talking to. You wanna like, you don't wanna like um, kind of assume that somebody else is thinking of some other kind of ring when you're, you know, it's like, you know, you just talk for a while and then they're like, oh, you mean associative, you know? And then, you know, so we're, we're gonna just try to, um, in case I forget, I really mean commutative unital associative rings. Okay. So uh, just a little sidebar there. All right, so um, that's the, um, the basic definition of these, of these things, but like, what are we going to uh, do with them? So, um, so uh, one very important uh, construction that, that, you, that you have is, um, so if I have some map, let's say F from X to Y, a continuous map of topological spaces, then if somebody gives me a, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say if somebody gives me a, um, a functor, 
on y, then I can get um, a functor on x. So when I so when here when I say like functor on x, really what I'm saying what I mean is like the ca the category of functors from the opposite category of open sets to to sets or to C, depending on whatever C might be at the time. So fun on X really means functor open sets opposite to C, for example. Okay. I'll just abbreviate that. Uh, fun. So um, this thing uh, is called F upper P. And then there's F lower P that goes in the opposite way or kind of the correct way, if you will. So let me define these things. These are not exactly in Hartshorn in this way. Um, maybe they're somewhere in Hartshorn, I'm not sure. Um, so these are like, um, you would call these the pre sheaf direct image and the pre sheaf inverse image maps. So definition um, FP of some uh, functor, if I evaluate it on you, this is the uh, the uh, taking the inverse image um, on on you, um, and you can and then with the kind of natural restriction maps. Right, so you can see if like B is contained inside U, then F of inverse of V is inside F inverse of U, and there's a natural restriction map, and these give you functors like that. Um, F upper P of F of some U. Well, this is a little bit uh, trickier because if you look at um, F of U, the image of some open set, it doesn't have to be open, and so you then uh, take a limit over all the open sets containing the image, and that's the definition. So this is the limit over V that contain F of U. This is a direct limit as you restrict more and more, and the open sets get smaller of the F of V. And uh, you know, also with the natural restriction maps. Okay, so. Um, you can uh, check that these take functors to functors and actually take pre sheaves to pre sheaves. Um, these take um, pre sheaves to pre sheaves. Okay. Um, uh, another thing to uh, mention is that if I have a, um, a pre-sheaf on a um, space with a single point is you know uh, equivalent to an object in C, I mean, or a set or whatever we're happen to be talking about. If I have a, if I have some if I have a one point uh, space, then you know th there's only two open sets. The empty set, if we're a pre sheaf has to evaluate to the terminal object. So we, that's determined. The only thing you need to say is what happens to the other object, uh, the other open set. And the answer is whatever you want. It's just some arbitrary object. So, um, you know, so. In other words, I guess what I'm really saying is that pre sheaf on X um, with values in, in C is naturally equivalent um, to, uh, to C itself. So there's an equivalence of categories. Okay, there's not very much going on there, but it's good to know. And I'm going to just kind of consider this as like an equality, you know, I mean, like, you, you tell me you, you have a pre sheaf on a on a single point, and that's really just you say what is a single object in that category. So um, now let me make a definition. Um, if um, F is a um, is let's say a, a pre sheaf 
or um, or functor, even. Um, but let's think pre sheaf and um, x is some point. Then we define the uh, stock of the sheaf to be well, you know, the pre sheaf associated to. I'll call it I X um, upper P of F, where I X is the inclusion of the one point space into X. You know, so you're basically taking your, your sheaf and you're like restricting it to that single point. What does that mean formally? You're looking at smaller and smaller open sets containing the point because that's the 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 image. Um, you know, so you know what you know what this is a this is a sheaf on a one point space. So it's determined by what it does on the whole space, which is a single point. And this is the formula for how you compute it. So if I plug in the whole space, then I look at all open sets um, that can. Um, that contain the image of that single point, which is the point itself, basically. So I look at the, the limit over all open sets containing X of F on that open set. And that is um, the, uh, you know, the, the concrete definition. So IE FX is the limit over the V containing X uh, of F of V. Professor, yeah, is this how we define um, a sub pre sheaf for any subset? Um, well, I mean, so this is not what we will call eventually a sub pre sheaf, um, but it's a pre sheaf associated to a subset, right, of X, right? It's a so if you give me any subset of or any subspace of my topological space, then then this gives me this uh, this um, pre sheaf pullback thing gives me a way of like kind of restricting my sheaf to that to that. Um, I'm, maybe I'm not answering your question. I'm not sure. Um, I, I made a mistake in my question, but okay. to like cl to clarify a little bit more, um, if you took just some subset yeah. and then asked for all the um, uh, open subset of that if you consider the subspace topology and then define the um, the object corresponding to that thing via this method would that then be a pre sheaf on that thing or maybe if it was a sheaf originally would it be a sheaf later um okay so if you will we'll we'll definitely um i guess answer some of that i mean so the so I guess what I what I'm saying is this thing. So I, I mentioned this thing takes pre sheaves to pre sheaves, both of these things. So if you have a pre sheaf on on X, and then you you use this upper P thing via some inclusion of something inside of X to kind of restrict it to some subspace, then you'll get a pre sheaf on that subspace in this way. Uh, you won't get a sheaf if you started with one necessarily. That's a little that's a little trickier, but you know, you will, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. So, um, okay. So we'll, um, so what we are going to get to next is, um, is the notion of uh, sheafification, um, going from pre sheaves to sheaves. Um, and so I'm going to do this um, in, in the following way. We're going to define the um, the atoll space of a um, pre sheaf. Okay, and this is actually going to be en route to proving our Cayley theorem, if you will. Right. So, um, by the way, you might ask, like, what is this word atoll? Um, atoll means something like um, kind of like spread out, kind of like flat and kind of all kind of like laid out and exposed, right? It's like, um, 
you know, like, um, you know, like if, uh, you know, like if, if you're, um, if you're, if you have a bunch of like stuff that's all like, you know, all over your desk and you kind of then like make it all neat and clearly laid out and you can kind of see everything that's like, you've made it at at all, you know? Okay. So that's, that's the idea. We're going to take a pre-sheaf and we're going to kind of like untangle it, spread it out, make it easy to look at. Okay. Apparently the atoll here and the atoll of atoll cohomology are not the same word. They are. One they has. Are. They are. I don't know who said that, but they are. Who said that? Uh, Richard Borchards. Yeah, I think he's wrong. Okay, that's my. They might. I think he said they have different numbers of accents. Like, there's an accent on both these or something. Or I mean, you can. So, yeah. No, no, I mean, so look. I mean, they have the like, they have the same root meaning. Yeah, like it's like whether or not like um, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't remember like grammar actually, but like, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, it's like, um, whether maybe it's like an adverb versus adjective issue or something like, it's like a, it's like a laid out space as opposed to a space that has been laid out or something, <laughs> you know, I don't know, like, I mean, it's, but it's, it's the same. It's, you know, okay. Despite whatever rumors are going around. Okay. So, um, a tall space of appreciation. So, um, okay. So let F be appreciative. Then, um, we define the, um, it's a tall space. So these are the set of pairs, I'll call them SX, where um, X is some point and S is in the stock of that point. You know, so it's just like, so this, this is like, you know, kind of a really big, crazy, Thing. So that, you know, so that notice this thing maps down to X, right, by uh, taking this pair to just the point. And so lying over every point is every possible, like, kind of function or bit of function locally near that point. Um, not to be annoying, but I don't think you actually said the word stock when you defined it up above. So if anyone's confused, Ooh. the f of x that's above is called stock. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and the elements of the stocks are called germs. Yeah, it's very agrarian. You know, we're all working on the field right now, moving our sheaves of wheat and all that. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so there's just a ton of stuff above a given X. There's all these like little, little germs of element, you know, of, of elements in the sheaf. Uh, but it also has a topology. So, um, we give a basis for the topology. It might actually just be I don't really even need to say, these are just the open sets actually, I guess. I mean, they're, I, they're probably not just a basis. I mean, they are, but I think they're just the open sets. The, um, this consists of um, the set of, um, well, let's see, um, um, consisting of these things that I'll call, let's say, um, U sub T's. So here, um, where u um, and x is open, and t is a section on that open set. So, so if you're given an open set and a section, then you get an open set in the etal space, which is the set of 
um, as x such that x is in u and s is equal to um, the, it's the image of t in the, um, s equals the image of t in, um, in fx. So by the definition of this direct limit, you have these maps, you know, this is one particular open set that contains x. And so it maps in this via the direct limit to, to that stock. So, um, so what you can check, and I'm not gonna, now I'm just gonna leave kind of a little bit of this as an exercise in some sense. I think it's actually an exercise, but <laughs> anyways, but like, but the, um, but then you can check that, um, that a map, um, that continuous maps, um, uh, let's say sections, uh, uh, how about I'll say it like this. I think I, ah, so we get, so this, we get a natural map um, of um, pre sheaves. So this is a, this is an X space, right? This, the, this atoll is, a, is an X space. And there turns out to be a natural map of pre sheaves from F to the, um, the sheaf associated to, I don't know, to this atoll space. It's kind of slightly different notation than I used before or whatever, but it, you know, we know what this map is. It has a natural map to X, right? Um, Right. So, really, what is, I mean, you know, if I'm if I'm on some open set U, right? So this, so what is this saying? You know, for example, f of U is going to map to sections um, to this atoll space on U, and if I have some particular um, T inside of here, then this is going to map. This is I, I want to associate this to a map from U um, to the atoll space. Um, like that, and how does it work? It's going to take x to the point um, um, x, and then um, I see I need like some actual notation. So I'm going to call it t sub x. But now let me, you know, so let me just make this notation. So because you know, so as I was saying, because this thing is this limit over these open sets, if we're given some t inside of f of v, where x is inside of v, then the image of t in fx will be denoted um, tx. And we call that the, the germ of t at x. And so that's what that's what this thing is 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 doing. So you can check. Um, so the so you can check that that these are continuous. And these are actually all the continuous um, sections. Um, well, actually, if we're a sheaf, sorry, <laughs> that's the other thing. No, so so then the sorry then the. Um, the kind of uh, theorem, if you will, is that if f is a sheaf, um, this is bijective. You know, these, um, you know, in other words, this is a, um, this is an isomorphism of pre-sheaves if it's actually a sheaf. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. So I was curious that, uh, is it true that uh, there's some kind of natural correspondence of this uh, ETAL space with fiber bundles? Um, you know, 
I mean, in some sense, yeah. I mean, the, so the, um, I mean, it's like a, it's, it's actually a bit like a, like a covering map in the sense that it's, okay. um, it's a, it's a local homeomorphism, right? Because like, if you, um, well, yeah, that, that's, that's right, I guess. I mean, um, what is it now? I mean, the, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, if you look at these, this open set um, U sub T. Okay. This open set U sub T actually is homeomorphic to U. Um, okay. And I guess like, um, yeah, I think that I, so I think that what you'll find is that, yes, no, that's right. That, so every point upstairs has an open neighborhood such that the restriction of that map to that open neighborhood is a homeomorphism onto its image. So that's usually okay. what we think of as a covering space map. Okay, I see, thank you. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's like a, it's like a covering space map, but just with lots and lots of sheets. Uh, professor? Yeah. I think I missed uh, something. What was S sub E T of F? Um, this is this uh, thing that we had way up in the beginning, this first example. Um, if somebody gives you a, yeah, sections. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to necessarily do this um, exercise, but like, I mean, but the, <coughs> but, you know, basically you're going to use the sheaf property, obviously, because if it wasn't a sheaf, it wouldn't work. Um, and the, um, you know, and really the, um, you know, the, so, well, okay. Yeah. Let me not, we can, we have Tuesday to talk about this kind of thing, right? <laughs> How to do actual things. If we want to, we can talk about it then. Let me move on. Okay. Um, so, okay. So the, if this is a sheaf, this is actually bijective. And, and moreover, um, it has this kind of universal property. So, um, you know, basically this is like the smallest sheaf that admits a map from your pre-sheaf. Um, there are different ways to say this. Um, one way to say this is that if I look um, at, at morphisms of presheaves from F to G, if this thing happens to also be a sheaf, then this is the same as morphisms of sheaves from this S a tall F um, to G. So it's, you know, so the, the idea is that there's a natural map from the S A tall F to any sheaf that admits a map from the original one and it all, okay. So this is a, this is a, some sort of universal property and it really is also saying that um, that that this process so well definition um, f plus is this s a tall thing and this is called sheafification um, and what we're what we're saying is that um, sheafification is um, left adjoint to the forgetful functor that takes a, a sheaf and just forgets that it's a sheaf and remembers only that it's a pre-sheaf. Okay. So um, as, a, as a corollary, we get this Cayley result, which is that, um, you know, if F is a sheaf, then F is the same as it's a tall guy. 
And so it is geometric. And so it's isomorphic to a geometric sheet. OK. So um, now we have just a few more things. Oh, we have more than a few more things. OK, well, let's see how we do. <laughs> OK. Um, so let me, let me mention that, um, that we care uh, mostly about sheaves and not so much about pre-sheaves. On the other hand, um, you have to really often use pre-sheaves to understand sheaves. You know, kind of uh, just like, you know, if somebody is like presenting to you, like trying to describe a group or some field or something like that, they might like say like, oh, okay, here's a ring and you just take fraction field of that, you know, or here's a bunch of generators and then you have to add in a bunch of inverses and stuff, you know. Uh, you know, they might give you a monoid and say, look at the group, you know, just in that same way, the things that naturally come to you, I mean, you care about the sheaf, but the things that naturally come to you are sheafifications of various pre-sheaves. You know, the sheaf, the pre-sheaves come first in the description because it's just a more convenient way to describe things. Um, so, um, yeah. So now well, let me give you uh, some kind of examples or symptoms of this kind of thing. So um, if you have some continuous map of topological spaces, um, then um, then we get these um, maps, which we call, again, the direct image, um, this time sheaves on X to sheaves on Y, and inverse image, sheaves on Y, sheaves on X. Uh, and they go as follows. So the lower star is just by definition the same as the other one. You can you can check that if you apply the lower star to a sheaf, then you get another sheaf back. Um, with the inverse image, it's not quite as nice. You um, you do the the pre sheaf inverse image, but the thing that you get if you do that to a sheaf doesn't have to be a sheaf again, um, and so you have to then sheafify it. Okay. So, um, you know, a really stupid example of that kind of thing would be, you know, if you have a, a map uh, from a, a space with two points to a space with one point, and you, um, and you pull back the constant sheaf, you get the constant pre-sheaf, but that's not a sheaf, you have to sheafify it, because it should have two different, you know, it should have, uh, you know, it doesn't have to, sections don't have to have the same value on the two points if you're a, if you're to be a sheaf, but the pre sheaf that can be a valid restriction. So when you sheafify, you get a little different. Okay. So um, right. So there's these these two different things now. Uh, but we will note, um, and it's very easy to to check that if f um, from u to x is an inclusion. then this thing is actually the same. You don't need to sheafify if it's an open inclusion. Sorry, not, not open inclusion. So kind of just restricting to an open set doesn't, doesn't do any harm. Um, also, um, in general, um, if F is any kind of inclusion, then we use the notation instead of F inverse of some sheaf, we'll often just say F restricted to Z, right? And when we're restricting to an open set, this is really honest, you know, and it <laughs> really, you know, there's no extra kind of subtlety involved. Okay. Um, 
Let's see. So similarly, um, let's see, we can talk about um, kind of the, the basic kind of bits of like homological algebra that we would want doing things like injections, surjections, co-kernels, quotients, images, all that kind of stuff. Um, and these are a little bit different depending on whether you're talking about pre-sheaves and sheaves. So it's a little, it's useful to keep track of that. So if I have a map from here to there of pre-sheaves, um, then, um, you know, then we then we say um, F is um, injective or maybe surjective if um, for all U, the um, corresponding maps <clears throat> are either injective or surjective. So that's for, for pre-sheaves. But if we have a map of sheaves, um, I mean, you know, we, we should really use like extra adjectives. We should say the map is pre-sheaf injective or pre-sheaf surjective, right? This is a, a statement about what kind of injectivity and surjectivity we mean. If you have a map of sheaves, we say, um, F is, you know, injective or surjective. This is like pre sheaf this is sheaf injective or sheaf surjective. If um, Fx from Fx to GF, it's the, if the induced maps on stocks are injective or surjective for all points. Um, okay. Um, you know, so, uh, right. Um, let's see. I can't read what I wrote in my notes. I'm sorry. One second. <laughs> um, ah, ah, ah. Right. Um, a useful case for our category C is the, ca is the case of abelian groups. So if C is abelian group, then we'll, um, we talk about um, abelian pre-sheaves and abelian sheaves. So these are just kind of the, the language and shorthand that we say for you know, pre-sheaves where the category C is abelian groups, we just call those abelian pre-sheaves and similarly abelian sheaves. Um, and in this particular case of abelian pre-sheaves and abelian sheaves, um, we can talk about pre-sheaf and sheaf images, kernels, co-kernels, and quotients. Right, so, um, so definition, we can talk about um, pre-sheaf image. So this is really the, um, this is defined as if you look at the image on some open set, then this is, so the pre-sheaf image on some open set is the image of F U, <laughs> right? Okay. So like, well, you know, what, so like if you have some F going to G via F, then for every particular open, you get a map F U from F U to G U. And the pre-sheaf image is the rule that associates for every open set the image of that map from FU to GU. It's kind of the, the obvious kind of thing. Similarly, um, pre-sheaf um, kernel. So I call it, I don't know, call it pre-image and then pre-kernel of F 
on u is the kernel of that corresponding you know map on each individual open set uh, and similarly um, pre-sheaf um, co-kernel just in the same way just assigning on every open set the co-kernel um, and as a special case of a co-kernel you can look at the pre-sheaf quotient so if we have f sitting inside of g an inclusion of abelian pre-sheaves by which i mean um, f of u is a sub of g of u for each u that I can look at the pre-sheaf quotient. The pre-quote of like g mod f. And you know, just in the same way. Okay, so these are all things that that we can do. And um, so these are all kind of you know straightforward constructions, um, but they don't quite work uniformly well for sheaves. So um, you know, and so similarly, definition: the sheaf um, image kernel co-kernel quotient in all these cases is the sheafification of the pre-sheaf image kernel co-kernel quotient. So, you know, how do you take an image? You, you like on every open set, you look at what the image is that gives you a pre-sheaf and then you sheafify it. And I'll just remark that um, kernel, that the pre-sheaf kernel and the sheaf kernel are the same for sheaves. Like for the kernel one, you don't actually have to sheafify it if you're looking at a map between sheaves. But all the other ones you might have to. So, um, you know, so, um, so it follows in either um, category, abelian pre sheaves or abelian sheaves, we can make sense of exact sequences. you know, like zero goes to A goes to B goes to C of either pre-sheaves or sheaves um, by saying, what does it mean to be exact? That F is the kernel of this map G and that G is the co-kernel of the map F. And in either case, you have like the thing that you would want, which is that if you look at the quotient of B mod, the image of F, then this is isomorphic to C, the kind of this first isomorphism theorem uh, works. It works in these two different categories for, you know, kind of two different reasons, but kind of the same kind of, you know, the same stuff works. Okay, so we have to be a little bit careful eventually is when we talk about exact sequences of abelian pre-sheaves and abelian sheaves, we have to be careful to know whether we're talking about exact in the sense of pre-sheaves or exact in the sense of sheaves because images and kernels mean different things in those different contexts. Uh, the answer will be that we'll pretty much always mean sheaves, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, but, but it's important to notice that the obvious definition of all these, ob of all these things is the pre-sheaf definition. And that's the correct definition for almost none of them, <laughs> right? You always have to sheafify and that adds an extra twist to, um, to, the, to the game. Okay, so um, remarkably, I just got to the end of my notes. 